Hi, everybody. We're going to kick this off. Uh, my name is Diana Eberlein. I'm the VP of Marketing at Source Technology. Uh, first of all, thank you all for taking the time to join us today. Welcome to the first of many Source sessions designed to help innovators and early adopters like yourself develop safe, stable, and scalable products for the consumer. I think it's safe to say we all thought the exchange of ideas and opportunities would be a little different, say at Expo West, Supply Side East, BevNet, which hasn't technically been canceled yet, um, and for those of you tuning in from Canada, Lyft in Toronto, uh, 2020 had something else in mind, but at Source Technology, we're dedicated to sharing our experience and expertise with you to advance the CBD industry. We hope that you continue to join us for our future webinars and utilize us as a reliable resource here to answer your questions from product development and formulation to regulatory to co-man and supplier support. Speaking of which, it is my pleasure to introduce your host for this webinar, Source Technologies Regulatory Manager, Mike Schmidt. I'll let him share with you a little bit more about his background in a minute here, uh, but Mike is our go-to, and now your go-to, for evaluating supplier processes and testing. A couple things before we get going. This webinar will be recorded and provided to all attendees following the presentation. To be most efficient with time and make sure we cover everything, we ask that you submit your questions via the chat and question boxes below to be addressed after the presentation during the Q&A portion. Any questions we don't get to address um, will, be, uh, will be included in a follow-up email and perhaps um, in a future webinar powered by Source. With that, let's get started with how to select a CBD supplier. Mike, you're up. Fantastic. Hopefully, clicking the switches is making everything work. It looks like things are moving forward. So, welcome, everybody. Appreciate you being here for this webinar. Uh, obviously, you're here to um, find out about uh, looking into CBD supplies and such. And so, I just wanted to give you a background on myself to give you an understanding of where I'm coming from. And, and why I've been asked to speak. So my formal education uh, covers uh, a Bachelor of Science in Microbiology, went on to a Master's of Business Administration with a Finance emphasis, and I tied that all together with a Master of Science in Food Science. And so that was a lot of book learning, and so I had a lot to uh, work on in terms of trying to get experience. And so for the last 17 years, I have done everything from work in the QA departments, to operations, research and development, regulatory, and innovations in the food and beverage space. So uh, when I was asked to come on board with Source, it, it seemed like a perfect fit because we have a great team of people that uh, goes across all those different departments. And so we wanted to make sure that we had the opportunity to bring forth food and beverage expertise to this space. And so uh, part of that background is also to let you know that I can help a lot of people answer a fair amount of questions. And so I wanted to throw a quick poll. Uh, you should be seeing it right now. And normally I do this in front of people and be able to get some feedback to help guide how I give the presentation. So if you could please, as an attendee, uh, click on uh, which of the following you are representing right now. Uh, are you a flavor house? Are you a co-manufacturer, supplier? Are you doing data and testing or are you doing brand or finished goods? For those that are on the uh, webinar, seeing the visuals and not just on audio. I'm gonna give it a couple seconds to start getting some feedback and such. This is, like I said, part of uh, me being able to either guide it if, we, if I find a group that is going to be a little bit uh, heavier in terms of uh, needs versus trying to answer all the questions and trying to cover all the bases all at once. So I really do appreciate you taking this poll to find that out. As of right now, we're at about 62% voted, so thank you very much for taking the time to do that. One of the wonderful things about uh, being able to work here is the fact that, like I said, we, we have a lot of people with food experience that are making sure that here in the cannabis space, we're doing everything we can to do uh, food safety, food quality, 
and help you do the same thing with your products too. So it looks like everything has stabilized for right now. And we seem to be heavy on brand and finished goods customers. Appreciate that. We have some suppliers and we have some flavor houses right after that. So I will do everything I can to actually look at this from a concept to commercialization uh, and how to work through that across the board a little bit more than, than uh, I would normally. I'm going to close this poll and actually add one more poll. Uh, basically, what, where is your expertise in terms of applications? Is it beverages? Is it edibles? Savory, edible, sweet, topicals, nutraceutical. Again, this is uh, kind of fine tuning based off of what we just saw, what type of products you're going to be looking into to make sure, again, what I'm saying is appropriate for the larger audience. That's not to shut anybody out. That is uh, to make sure that we utilize this time efficiently. And then any extra questions we will definitely get to at the end of the presentation or follow up by email. And we're at 30% vote right now. And it is an interesting uh, group as of right now. We seem to be on the beverage, sweet edibles, and uh, some nutraceuticals in there too. So this is great feedback. We definitely have been working with <laughs> Uh, our applications team on probably roughly this type of percentage uh, in terms of being able to help. So this is this is a lot of fun to see from from my point of view. We're now at 60% vote, and they're still coming in, so I'm not going to close it as of yet. Uh, And they seem to be leveling out. So I'm going to close this poll. Thank you very much. It seems to have gone beverages, nutraceuticals, and sweet edibles and such. So thank you again. I'll again try to speak to all of those points. So why are you here? Well, you know why you're here. You're wanting to find out what you can do to look for a good CBD supply. Now I need you to understand that we are not a CBD extractor. We are a water-based uh, emulsion company for CBD. We help you get the CBD into your products. We ourselves are at the mercy of the CBD extract industry at this point, and it has been really quite interesting to go through that because uh, of my background and how Source was built from the ground up around foods and beverages, it has been um, kind of uh, challenging to find suppliers that meet food and beverage needs while at the same time being able to provide a consistent product and such. And so uh, we wanted our trials and tribulations to be able to help you in the long run. So ultimately what we're doing today is walking through the process that we went through in order to make sure that we can let you know how to move forward when selecting a CBD supplier. Again, we are not an extractor, but we do sell a water-based CBD emulsion that can help you with your product. We ended up going through about 60 different suppliers, and of those 60 suppliers, only five of them met our stringent needs in terms of safety, in terms of quality, in terms of being registered as hemp growers, et cetera, et cetera. So again, I'm gonna walk through kind of from a concept commercialization thought process, as you see here on the table of contents, and discuss exactly what I and the rest of the source team had to look into and keep in mind when selecting a CBD supplier. You can read uh, the table of contents. Again, this information will be available to you after the presentation, so I'm not gonna read through it, but ultimately, as I said, I want to go from a concept to commercialization thought process and, and hit all those different departments that are affected by bringing in a CBD product. One of the biggest things that you are definitely aware of is trying to make sure that you are putting out a safe product. 
the only way that you can assure that you're putting out a safe product is by bringing in safe supplies of products and such, and then working under good manufacturing practices to get a safe product and a great tasting product out the door to your customers. So number one, your CBD supplier will play a role in your safety. When you do your risk assessment on your raw materials, and I'll go into that later, you need to have a lot of information up front in order to say, yes, they're safe, or no, they're not safe. Again, I'll walk through that at a later date. Do you have any label claims that you are going to push through uh, based on your brand? Are, are you looking for organic? Do you need a kosher product? Does this uh, product brand have a uh, need to say, hey, we are all natural, non-GMO, things like that. You have to make sure that all those questions are asked of your supplier before you even work with them or else it's going to throw off your label claims in the long run. Stability. What type of stability does the finished product have in your finished product? What type of stability does the raw ingredient have in your finished product that the consumers are going to see? And when I talk stability, I'm not only talking uh, whether or not the CBD breaks down or uh, attaches itself to the inside liner of your container, but I'm also talking about stability of being able to be dispersed into your product too. We're talking beverages here and CBD extracts are not water soluble or they're very difficult to put into water. They don't want to mix very well. So we'll be talking about that in a, in a bit. Product quality. A lot of people define quality with different uh, descriptors. Some people say quality is being able to produce the same flavor profile every single time. Some people uh, call quality as the visual or, or the, the mouthfeel associated with it. So CBD suppliers will play a role in all of that because number one and number two for foods and beverages is taste and texture of that product. What type of mouthfeel does it have and how will uh, the CBD supply affect that? And as I mentioned earlier, the, what's the consumer experience out of all this? Are they going to really, really enjoy it on batch number one but um, when, when they come back as a repeat buyer, have a different experience than they did the first time. Again, your CBD supplier really does matter. I bring this all up because this has been, the cannabinoid space has been kind of across the board because the federal government has really not put out any standards. And so people can make a lot of claims because there are no standards to match that up against. And the Journal of American, the JAMA, Journal of American Medical Association, did take a look and found that of 84 products purchased from 31 online CBD retailers, only 31% were accurately labeled. That's a fairly high amount and does not bode well for uh, consumers having great experiences with finished products. So, one of the biggest things that we talk about when we start looking for suppliers of CBD extract is making sure that the product quality is going to be there. Not only are you trying to source correctly, but then you, do you have development working to make sure that it's working correctly for your product? And I'll, and I'll bring that up in a little bit when uh, I start talking about a little bit of uh, product development and such. Also, uh, it's one thing to get a sample of the product uh, into your hands, but it's another thing to have support afterwards saying, well, we are going to can the product using a Velcrin technique. Will your product work afterwards? Uh, versus we're going to go through a pasteurizing heat tunnel. I've got a product that is a low pH of 3.8. I've got a neutral uh, product. Can your supplier help you answer those questions as you go through to define what your product is at the very end as it sits in your consumer's hands, bring that back and ask if the supplier can help you meet those needs. Also, the resource uh, and strategic partners is, is what I was just talking about. Can they help you from concept to commercialization all the way out to first batch if necessary? Because sometimes you may be um, trying to add the product utilizing technique A for mixing and then find out that at your co-manufacturer or at the facility, it's a different type of uh, mixing capability. Do you have the backup to say on the fly, oh no, we don't have the 
procedures that we thought and then be able to make it work because you're spending a lot of time and effort at a command trying to get your product out the door. So big picture scale, does your CBD supplier have the paperwork and have the background to meet your needs? As I said earlier, we had to go through roughly 60 different suppliers to make sure that they had the documentation that was necessary to say, yes, we can trust and uh, know that they've reduced the risk of any physical contamination, chemical contamination, or microbiological contamination of the raw material before it even gets into your hands. I'm bringing up this slide right now, not as a name and shame type situation, but as a example of what type of warning letters that are happening uh, coming from the FDA. There seems to be two main types of warning letters to manufacturers right now. One is uh, manufacturers making claims that are health claims, uh, that, that the CBD contained within will cure cancer, will do uh, something for pain, and things like that. The FDA is, is wonderfully consistent in protecting the uh, American uh, consumer that medical claims are not being put forth that are not founded. So warning letters are going out for that. This slide is about warning letters that have gone out for um, brands that have said, we have X amount of milligrams per serving of CBD in there. And when testing comes around, it's not there. It, it's fraud. It may be, it's probably inadvertent. I'll be honest with you. It probably is, is inadvertent. Uh, but a warning letter was still issued because there is a situation in which if you make a claim, that claim better be followed up and, and you're, you are not harming the public economically by saying it's in there, you're paying for it, and then they find out that it's not in there. So again, it's not a name and shame situation, but you need to work with a supplier that will be able to stand behind you and walk through and even have the systems in place to scientifically prove that what you say was put in there was really put in there so you can do your own type of follow-up and, and make sure that you understand what could go wrong. So this is the development part of a trying to understand what you need from a supplier. One of the things that we've been finding is that we have customers that really have a brand that wants to deliver on, this is a cannabis product. They want that flavor of cannabis coming through. They want that, that funk. They want that wonderful terpene flavor profile that comes through and that delivers on their brand promise to their customers. Some customers uh, are of, of ours we're finding have consumers and a brand that says that maybe they're canna curious and maybe they don't really want the quote unquote stigma of having a cannabinoid in their product. And therefore they don't want that, uh, that green note. They don't want the terpenes that come along with it. So one of the first things that you really have to do when developing your product is A, to find what your brand experience is gonna be and B, develop towards that brand experience. And what we've been finding is that those that really want to showcase a specific flavor, uh, such as strawberry or lemon lime or some sort of flavor without having a um, cannabis uh, flavor, go with an isolate. An isolate is the least flavored of all the compounds that you can get from a, a CBD extract. That is something that, uh, for the most part, the cannabinoid on its own in an isolate will, will add a little bit of bitterness, but sometimes that bitterness is, is necessary for an overall uh, rounded flavor profile. Get to know the isolate and get to know the flavor as you put them together in your beverage or your edible or in uh, even on the nutraceutical side. Uh, what type of flavor is your delivery system going to have and can you deliver it consistently? Now, if your brand promise is all about the cannabis flavor, go with a broad spectrum or a full spectrum. When I say broad spectrum versus full spectrum, I'm talking about a product that has no THC in the broad spectrum and potential less than 
uh, in the full spectrum. And I've got a visual uh, coming up uh, to kind of give you that understanding, but you have to understand up front what your consumer brand uh, uh, story is going to be and how you're going to deliver it. So we always say, if you, if you use an isolate, you want your flavor to shine through. If you have a broad spectrum, you have a flavor that either enhances the broad spectrum flavor, or you have something that might uh, have kind of a, a neat synergy with that flavor. So that's the main reason why I'm talking about isolates versus broad spectrums up front. This uh, inverted pyramid comes from NSF International, who is a standards body here in the United States. They are a nonprofit, but they do play a role in trying to define a lot of dietary supplements and set up systems to make sure that uh, there are standards out there, uh, even though that there might not be standards in, in, uh, in place already. And so this is what they are proposing as a discussion for what crude hemp is versus full spectrum broad, standardized, uh, refined, and then isolate type products. Ultimately, what we're talking about is starting at the first pass from the biomass extract of crude hemp. When they do that first pass extract, it's they're taking all the fat soluble products, that is stuff that dissolves in fat and fat and water do not mix oil and water do not mix so that's why it's very important to uh, find a supplier that can help you get it into your product one way or another so the crude hemp has everything it's got the cannabinoids it's got the terpenes it's got the lipids it's got the chlorophyll it is a funky mess that turns brown this deep deep brown because the chlorophylls are, are breaking down and it it it's pretty impressive, but it's probably not something that you really want to work with. Full spectrum is a uh, distillation of that or a winterization of that to remove the uh, fats, oils, lipids, and the chlorophyll. What it leaves behind is all the cannabinoids and all the terpenes, but they are uh, saying that the THC is still in there. So Right now, uh, based on 2018 Farm Bill, uh, they are distinguishing between the marijuana plant and the hemp plant by saying, on a dry weight basis, there's less than 0.3% THC. They haven't talked about products, but within the industry, people are saying, as long as it's got less than 0.3% THC in a extract, that seems to be going along with what the regulators are allowing at this point. So full spectrum will have the THC, but the broad spectrum won't. And if you are looking for a broad spectrum, because you don't want THC in there, make sure that your supplier can get you a certificate of analysis that shows that there's non-detect THC. If a supplier gives you a C of A that says zero THC in there, be aware that um, technology and techniques at the lab are always going to be changing. There is no standard way of detecting THC as of yet. The Association of uh, Chemists, AOAC, is coming up with a standardized way so that every lab will come up with the same answer if they're given the same product. But for right now, for somebody to say that there's zero THC in something, double check. Maybe they actually meant non detectable because. There's, there's lower limits uh, of quantification or, or detection that is associated with THC at this point. So um, definitely ask about the certificate of analysis if you're looking for a broad spectrum and don't want any THC going into your products. Uh, the hemp standardized extract is uh, some new thought processes along with the refined hemp extract. Look, we're looking at and talking about an agricultural material that will have varying amounts of naturally occurring terpenes and cannabinoids that will change depending on what the weather was during the growing season, where it was grown, what type of soil it was grown in, and things like that. And so uh, as part of your consumer brand promise, will your supplier be able to get you a flavor profile that is similar lot to lot, year to year? And are they going to be able to uh, 
help you deliver your flavor profile promise to your customers as, as, and your consumers as it comes through. And then we end up at the isolate, like I talked about earlier. That should be as pure as possible with almost no flavor whatsoever associated with it. This grid is to help you quickly visualize what to expect in all the different things. Just quickly, full spectrum versus broad spectrum versus CBD isolate, terpenes and all cannabinoids versus uh, terpenes and cannabinoids minus the THC versus just the cannabinoid of uh, of what you're looking for, in this case, CBD. So this, I'm still talking on the development side. If you are going to go with a broad spectrum product, are you going to match it up with a barrier citrus flavor? They both have some sort of green notes behind them. Can those barrier citrus flavors actually deliver on a great broad spectrum uh, ca cannabis fruit flavor combination? I've actually seen a whiskey cannabis combination, which was actually quite good from one of our flavor houses that we work with. And in one of the things is, not only should you have a supplier of CBD that you trust, hopefully you already have a flavor house that you trust or, or a group of flavor houses that you trust to help walk through this CBD supply that comes in to ma either match up, to enhance, or to um, complement the flavor of either the broad spectrum or have a great flavor that the isolate will allow to shine through. All right, so this is the operation side of things. This picture that you see right now is actually a small beaker that has our broad spectrum raw material before we make it into an emulsion in it. And I had the beaker flat on the surface and I tilted it up. And if you kind of look at the top, you can see that it's not flowing at all. This is at room temperature. This product is very viscous, is very tough to work with, and is very difficult to disperse evenly into a gummy, is very difficult to disperse into a brownie, is very difficult to disperse into a beverage, unless you have some great high shear equipment and have the ability to take your time to make sure that all the chunks are broken up, you have a homogenizer to break it up, uh, lots of shear forces going on. So try to make sure that you can work with somebody that's going to help you either break it up uh, and or get it into your product and so there are ways of doing that as i mentioned earlier cbd extracts are fat soluble that is they go into oil and fats really easily so your CBD supplier should be able to work with you. If you have a chocolate, you can put that into the cocoa butter and mix it in with the cocoa butter to evenly disperse it into your chocolate products. That's the part that's fantastic. If your product has a high amount of fat, dissolve it into the fat, put that fat back together with your finished product, sell it all day long. The problem comes when you are trying to put it into your beverage, trying to put it into a gummy, trying to put it into some sort of edible that has a fair amount of water to start with. Because if you do that and you don't break that extract into small enough chunks, you're going to get hot spots. Your testing is going to be off. You might have a situation where somebody might bite into your product or drink part of your uh, uh, product that started coming off the line at the very beginning. But they might have a hot spot. There might be several more milligrams in there than expected, which means at the end of the run, there's going to be less product CBD in there. In your product and you might end up with inadvertently showing that you might not have what you are claiming on your product so therefore again you need to be able to work with your supplier to help understand how to disperse that into your finished product i'm talking across the board like i said fat based products versus water-based products and there are different ways of getting that in versus um, mixing it in, you can make uh, emulsions out of it, you can buy emulsions of, of CBD. Uh, there are nano emulsion technologies out there. I personally uh, try to step away from the nano 
side of things, because right now, from a regulatory standpoint, CBD is not officially supposed to be in foods. From the FDA standpoint, there are states that have, have said, we want uh, cannabis extracts in our products, and they've set up their rules around that. CBD, for the most part, uh, actually not for the most part, we have not seen any warning letters from the FDA going out to customers that have CBD in their foods and beverages out on the market because the FDA hasn't officially found anything poisonous about it. They have not officially found anything that is going to be harmful for the public. They just need more information. And, and that came out, uh, I think, last month, saying we just need some more information on toxicology and liver and things like that. But for the most part, they haven't shut it down because they haven't found it to be poisonous to the public. And there's a huge demand for it. So, so um, customers of ours are meeting that demand right now, and they're doing it safely. But if you have somebody saying that they're going to sell you nano emulsion technology, be careful because that adds another layer of scrutiny to the product that you have because nano technology is, uh, you have to prove that the nano size of your product is actually safe or as safe as the regular size of your product. So, so keep that in mind from a regulatory standpoint. Now, from a supply chain standpoint, if you can't get a certificate of analysis, it's time to turn around and not work with that supplier. You are gonna run into a big problem associated with uh, trying to get any other type of paperwork from them. If they can't handle a basic certificate of analysis, go on to the next potential supplier. Thing is, is that you need to have a good understanding and do a risk analysis of the product coming in because you have to be able to say that you have a safe product. One of the things that we ended up having to do is ask a lot of questions because not only are we dealing with a extract, but because this is so new to the uh, food and beverage world, we actually had to step back one step further beyond just the extract and look at the risk associated with the biomass. So with the extract itself, does the extract have any um, solvent residue left over? after they, they extracted it and then concentrated it down. Uh, but that's just associated with just the extract itself. What about the biomass? Uh, was it dried correctly? Was, was mold allowed to grow on it before they extracted? Mold growth might mean mycotoxin. So you might have to do some mycotoxin, mycotoxin testing uh, of that material. Did, do you know where it came from in the United States? Was it grown in soil with heavy metals? Did you do a heavy metal testing? you would still have to do a risk analysis on this product. Work with a supplier that either says, we've already done the risk analysis for you, or work with a supplier that can show you that, that they are handing you a safe product based on your needs for a risk analysis. This is a example of, uh, on the left, some of the testing that we do for our raw materials and our finished products. On the right, those are some of the questions I get asked as the regulatory manager, along with my team, of being able to supply these types of either statements or types of documentation showing that, do you have a HACCP plan in place? Have you done everything you can to control physical and chemical hazards? Have you done an audit? Have you had a third-party audit take a look at, at uh, your systems to make sure that you're, you are following your own risk analysis and your own recommendations. It's really important to be able to work with a supplier that can help you bundle up all the information you need so that you can prove to yourself and to any auditors that might be coming through that you have a safe product to begin with. Make sure your supplier can get all that for you. On a big picture scale, this is our recommendation to have uh, in your hands before you put it into your product. Take a look at not only your cannabinoid potency, and maybe even follow up with a, another third party uh, test to, to make sure that their CFA matches up with your test of the CFA, but also uh, the potency profile of, of the whole entire thing. I think I just said that. You're gonna, you're gonna need potency and overall cannabinoid profile and be able to understand that if you said you didn't want THC in there, there better not be any THC under the profile of the product. Also make sure that the microbial profile uh, meets your risk needs there too. 
take a look at uh, when the testing was conducted. If the testing on this lot was done three years ago, uh, it, it might be time to re redo that test and make sure that there hasn't been any degradation over time. Still talking, well, actually now talking on the operational side, do you have somebody that can help you scale up or utilize the equipment that you're going to work with? One of the things that I'm really uh, happy to be part of a team is having somebody that can help on, the, on that side of things, help with the equipment, help actually apply all the knowledge associated with getting it into your processes and making sure that it's gonna be a safe and repeatable product. Do you have somebody that can help you understand what type of packaging to go into? Do they have any understanding of the potential for um, the CBD sticking to the insides of the liner on the aluminum cans that you're about to use? Is there any type of uh, problems in glass uh, of, of light degradation, things like that? Uh, I'll, I'll be honest with you, for us, we've learned a lot and we have a lot of customers across the board that uh, want to be able to put this into fruit cups that are shelf stable and such. And so we are actively working with a lot of different groups that, that are trying uh, to put CBD into their products. And, and one of the nice things is for us, we have that background to be able to send some expertise information through to anybody looking for that. Hopefully your CBD supplier, uh, either on the extract side or on the water emulsion side can, can do the same for you. I spoke earlier about stability. When we talk stability, is will the CBD uh, be stable within your system? But also, is it evenly distributed throughout the entire product? One of the things that we have uh, internal to us is the ability to actually measure that type of stability, the emulsion stability, not only in the emulsion in our finished product, but also how the emulsion works in your finished product. This is a picture of uh, using what we call a turbo, uh, turbo scan. Turbo scan. Yes. Basically, along the x axis is shining light through at zero millimeters at the very bottom, and then it slowly goes up through 50 millimeters through the top of the vial and shining light through to take a look at how much light goes in, how much scattering occurs, how much light gets reflected back. And in this case, we're seeing that there's sedimentation and stratification occurring. This is a bad emulsion. This is something that you do not want to see in your product over time. And if you take a look at these, we're talking 12 days on the left side and 79 days on the right side. So, so these broke pretty fast in terms of emulsion. Now, this is what a good emulsion will look like. It will look, it'll be boring. You won't see any changes over time. And this is one of uh, our customers' products at 124 days. This is something that you need to be able to have or be able to test for in order to make sure that you're going to deliver on, on your brand promise. Or else, if it sediments or if it floats to the top, your customer, your consumer is going to get either that, that all the CBD in the first slug in their first drink, or they're going to have to go all the way to the bottom of the can to get their CBD that they've been, uh, that they have purchased. One of the biggest reasons why we are seeing uh, people switch suppliers, and actually uh, we haven't had to yet, but there, there's been a couple times that we, we definitely had to have conversations, is inconsistent product. You need to be able to run your business from an operation standpoint, from a supply chain standpoint, from a financial standpoint, by making sure you understand how much CBD you brought in and how much is going out the door in, to get into the hands of your consumer. If that is inconsistent, you are constantly adjusting what your batch sizes are, how your batching occurs, and things like that. Work with a supplier that can give you a, a, a supply or product that is consistent over time or can prove that they've uh, sold consistent product over time through certificates of analysis that you trust. And again, you're looking for a partner that's gonna help you go from concept to commercialization, and you're also looking for somebody that's gonna be there for you 
when any of these questions are going to come up. Can they help you find a, a flavor house uh, or a flavor house that has been trusted or that is known on the market? Can they help you with co-manufacturers? Sometimes uh, making a, a run of 10,000 cans might be way too small because uh, some of these co-manufacturers say, yes, there's a 200,000 can minimum. Do you, do you have a network that you can uh, lean on for your CBD suppliers? Also, do they have trusted raw material suppliers that they can pass on to you? So overall, I, I went through a lot of information. I recognize that, and I know there's gonna be a lot of questions. Go ahead, start putting those through. I'm getting close to the end. If you have any questions, put those into the chat. But I went through, again, kind of an idea of concept commercialization. I tried to take a look at it from many departments, points of views from supply chain to operations, to developers, uh, to even regulatory on there. And, I, and, and hopefully covered uh, what water-based products such as beverages or edibles that start uh, with a, a nice mix that you bake all the water out and such, or even on the nutraceutical side. Hopefully I, I covered all those needs, but this is the time to write in your questions. I'm gonna work with Diana to find out what those questions are. And we've got about uh, 15, 10 to 15 minutes to answer those questions and we'll take it from there. So Diana, are, is anything coming up? Hi, uh, it looks like you were thorough enough to not get too many questions, but I actually have one. Um, so I figured I would throw one your way, maybe a curveball. Um, you know, something that you touched on was some of the regulatory hurdles that, that some of our customers have. Do you have a couple of the, the most frequently asked ones that maybe you can touch on while we have some time here? I do. And, and one of the things that this regulatory uh, landscape is at right now is very rocky. <laughs> there are no easy paths from point A to point B through the regulatory landscape right now because the federal law is inconsistent with some local state laws, which is inconsistent with some uh, county and or city laws at the same time. Please understand on a big picture scale, we're dealing with cannabinoids across the board. So there is going to be a, a level of uh, business risk that you as a uh, customer of, of the cannabinoid industry that's going to enter this world of edibles or nutraceuticals or beverages, you have to understand up front, you're, you're taking a small risk of um, running into some regulatory uh, issues. But as I said earlier, the FDA, from a federal standpoint, hasn't said CBD is a poison, get it out of the food system 100%. They also haven't said hey, we accept it as a generally recognized as safe product. We need to gather a little bit more information for us to either give the grass status or give grass status with uh, some uh, caveats. So for example, uh, does it have any drug interactions? They would just want to know, is it, do they have to put warnings on, on uh, keeping uh, product safe so you don't mix it accidentally with with another medication that the general population might be on. It's stuff like that that the FDA is just trying to make sure of. Now from a state standpoint, we have 11 states that allow uh, regular, uh, that's what I'm trying to say here, uh, recreational marijuana and have folded in cannabinoids as part of what can be sold within their state. Now we're seeing a lot of our customers moving CBD products from point A to point B, and they're saying, hey, there's no THC in here, so therefore we feel comfortable that we're, we're sending safe products. And as I said, we are not coming across any uh, evidence that people are being stopped at borders, not being allowed to move CBD across borders like they would if they were moving THC across borders. So again, regula regulations right now, you just gotta understand you're, you're gonna have to have a little bit of risk associated with uh, doing this. And our customers have uh, responded in, in turn. We have some large manufacturer customers that are working on uh, being able to have products ready to go when the FDA says, hey, it's okay to put it into foods and beverages. We also have some smaller customers that are saying, hey, we've got this great opportunity before the big ones get in here to establish ourselves as, as some pioneers in, in working with cannabinoid uh, edibles and, and drinkables and such. And so 
regulations across the board ultimately are saying, hey, be safe about it, be able to speak to the safety of your product, and they're taking it from there. I said earlier, warning letters are coming out for those that are defrauding the product uh, public and warning letters that are uh, coming out that they're making claims on there that should not be uh, talking about disease states and stuff like that. That's the only time that I'm seeing the FDA act actively getting involved. So, so understand what your risk tolerance is and move forward from there. Okay, we had a handful of questions come in uh, while you were explaining the regulatory hurdles. Um, we'll try and get to as many as we can in the next nine minutes or so. Anyone who did submit a question, if we don't get to your question, we'll follow up directly with you. Um, and we, hopefully these questions will be things that we cover in future webinars as well. Um, we did have one question come through for you, Mike. Um, what are some re uh, resources you could recommend for water soluble suppliers? What, what would you use to quantify the product besides potency? Well, uh, as I said earlier, we are not a CBD extractor. We actually take CBD extracts and make them into water soluble uh, emulsions. So I would be remiss by not saying, hey guys, we actually have a water soluble liquid and a powder to go into uh, water bottle sachets of either tea or, or other dry products in a ready to mix situation. Take a look for um, a company that, as you said, potency is something you definitely need to know so you can formulate your products around the potency of the product coming through, but also find out if they have the ability to help you understand how stable the product is the raw and material, the emulsion is going to be in your finished product. By that I mean oil and water, like I said earlier, do not mix. Oil has less density than water. How does one make oil balance itself out into different products? Well, we have to know the density of water and we have to know the density of your finished product. So can your supplier of your CBD emulsion work with you to provide a stable emulsion that will work in zero bricks or, or zero solids waters, much like a lot of the uh, flavored seltzers that are out there or the flavored carbonated waters that are out there right now. Can that supplier uh, help with a six bricks or, or, or a uh, decently heavy, heavily sugared product, which is more dense than water would be? Do they have the ability to say, yes, we, we can get you balanced products that will work in the long term for your finished product. Now that's not gonna be quite a big uh, deal for you on the edible side or the nutraceutical side in which you're going to put it into a matrix like a, uh, a brownie mix or into a gummy of some sort in which that matrix will be set uh, to, to prevent the, the separation of, of the CBD oil from uh, in the emulsion into uh, the gummy because it just won't happen. That gel will hold it into place. But it definitely plays a huge role in beverages and some high water uh, foods. You don't want that separation to come out. So can your supplier help you understand the long-term ramifications uh, as your product sits on the shelf waiting to be picked up by your consumer? Awesome. Thanks, Mike. Um, this will probably be the last question we get to on this webinar. Just be respectful of everybody's time. Um, but as I mentioned, we will be uh, replying to everyone's individual questions and making sure that we get you answers or a follow-up call if needs to go into more depth. Um, the final question that we'll wrap up here with today is about GMP certification. Um, basically about our qualification process and um, you know how do we properly certify that our supplier is indeed GMP certified. So good manufacturing practices and current good manufacturing practices in 21 CFR part 117 do talk about the food industry. And because of the FDA is not 100% behind saying or agreeing that this um, CBD emulsions are part of the food supply, they really don't have the authority over how this is made. However, that shouldn't stop you from buying from a company that can show that the co-manufacturers have gone through some sort of global food safety initiative audit. By that I mean, do they have a BRC audit, uh, British Retail Consortium audit? Do they have an SQF audit? Do they have something that adheres to 
the Global Food Safety Initiative, GFSI, uh, standards. If they do, that means that they have the systems in place that doesn't look at just one part of an overall system of, let's say, the raw materials coming in. It takes a look at distribution. Do they have a recall plan if something goes wrong? They took a look at the building structure. How is that going to work on making sure that pest control is easy? Have they uh, calibrated their equipment on a regular basis to make sure that their potency results uh, or their third-party potency results are repeatable every time? Are there letters of guarantee that say if something messes up and and uh, truly affects your company, can that be can you may be made whole again afterwards? It's training, code dating, uh, res residual chemical testing, good housekeeping. SQF, BRC, GFSI takes into account the entire system to make sure that the product being made within those walls are going to be made with current good manufacturing practices and can back it up and have been audited against what they say they are doing and what they uh, are able to do based off of their policies. So definitely ask to see either the um, manufacturers uh, GFSI type audit or at least their co-man's GFSI audit to help you be more assured that you're going to be getting a, a product that was made under good manufacturing conditions, you still have to do a risk assessment of all your raw ingredients as they come in. But having a, a BRC audit or an SQF audit really helps you uh, understand that the risk has been reduced. Awesome. Thank you so much, Mike. And thank you everyone for tuning in today. Um, I think it's been a very productive and informative hour here. Um, as I mentioned, uh, we will be sending some direct messages to those who asked questions that we didn't get to today. You will also get a follow-up email uh, thanking you again for your time with a recording of this webinar. There will also be included in there a survey. Uh, we would really appreciate your uh, feedback so that we can continue to deliver educational information and move, um, you know, move this industry forward as a whole. Um, and there will also, for those of you who qualified and, and uh, reserved your spot early for our webinar and get a CBD wellness kit, um, please keep an eye out for this email because this is where you'll be submitting your mailing address for that kit. Um, thank you again today. Um, please, you know, we look forward to uh, hopefully seeing you on future webinars um, and please stay healthy and safe. Thank you so much. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you, everybody.